Hooray, another paleo profile, and this time on an animal most of you will probably recognize and not some of those obscure ones. Today we have the one, the only, Dunkleosteus, the giant predatory Devonian armored fish that is one of the freakiest things that has ever inhabited the Earth's oceans. In this video, I will talk about Dunkleosteus, but I also want to take this video as an excuse to talk about probably one of my favorite time periods, the Devonian, and the amazing fish that inhabited it, namely the Placoderms, the extinct group which Dunkleosteus was a member of. And not just the famous Placoderms too, we will examine a lot of the forgotten ones, and some of the very, very interesting, extremely recent and revolutionary discoveries about them. So, holy crap, I love this topic so much, so without further ado, Dunkleosteus, the Devonian, and... The Placoderms. So what was the Devonian? Before the first mammals, before the first dinosaurs, before the first reptiles, and before the, even the first amphibians, before any land vertebrates existed, we had the Age of the Fish, or the Devonian, which started about 420 million years ago. The Devonian was an interesting time in vertebrate evolution. Before the Devonian, massive invertebrates like Eurypterids, or sea scorpions, orthocones, and anomaloacrids ruled the entire oceans for hundreds of millions of years, while our ancestors, the first jawless fish, with backbones and internal skeletons, had to remain small and lower on the food chain. The fish during this time were in a situation much like the mammals during the reign of the dinosaurs. But just as the dinosaurs had their reign, and it ended, so did the massive invertebrates. By the Silurian, the period just before the Devonian, the dominance of the invertebrates was coming to an end, with the extinction of most mega arthropods and cephalopods, which had been king from basically since the Cambrian. This change opened up a niche vacuum for a new age of animals, the first jawed fishes, or Nothostomata. Hopefully I won't have to say that too much. This new and improved fish group quickly diversified into several distinct and unique body designs which carried over to the Devonian, all of which could have been the future template for all future vertebrates. Thus, a competition between the different fish factions began. You see, the Devonian was a turning point. Now that the invertebrates are gone, a new family of animals will fill their place. Three different main families of fishes evolved and became the possible inheritors of the world. And like the different houses battling for the Iron Throne in Game of Thrones, these fish families fought for domination over the Earth. The Devonian was a battleground for which who will inherit the Earth for the next 400 million years in the sea and on the land would be decided. The future of the planet would rest on these fish groups to rule, but which group would inherit this new world was the question. As said before, it was once thought, more on that later, that there were three distinct separate and unique main groups of fish during this time period. These were the cartilaginous fish, such as the ancestors to sharks, with skeletons primarily composed of cartilage and not bone, the placoderms heavily armored fish with bony head plates lacking teeth, and bony fish with internal skeletons made primarily out of bone, which included bony plates in the head, which would later give rise to coelacanths, ray finned fish, and even tetrapods like us. Yes, you are a type of fish, don't deny! The Devonian was a contest, a standoff between these three distinct groups on who would dominate and flourish over the other groups, as well as a race to the land. Dun dun dun. Yes, the Devonian was the time when finally vertebrates colonized the land. It was an evolutionary arms race much like the fish equivalent to the space race, on who could reach the land first. It was an exciting time, the existence of dinosaurs, whales, elephants, spinosaurus, raptors, and basically everything with a backbone on land was determined by this time period. How I am describing the Devonian, of course, is all exaggerated. Never did these fish really fight or have battles, nor did the individual fish species nor groups of fish have goals or intentions of interspecies domination, besides reproducing or eating. But when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, the Devonian had some pretty big stakes. Of course we know who won, Durr. but if the conditions were right, you wouldn't be sitting here watching this video. In an alternate timeline, you could be a terrestrial shark or placoderm from a world where bony fishes lost and tetrapods never evolved. Instead, three-limbed, armor-plated, beaked creatures or boneless land sharks ruled the world instead of our four-limbed ancestors. It was even thought a placoderm was discovered to be somewhat terrestrial and could have been the placoderm version of Tiktaalik, with primitive lungs for breathing air. We now know this was a misinterpretation and a mistake by a 1940s paleontologist, but who knows, maybe a future discovery will find a transitionary land placoderm, showing just how competitive the Devonian seas were back then. Well, anyways, the Devonian really was the decider of what our world would look like as far as vertebrates go. It could have ended entirely differently, and it's interesting to speculate if things were different. Well, anywho, during the Devonian, as the Battle of the Fishes played out, the placoderms dominated Earth's ecosystems for the most part, in both the oceans and the freshwaters. And that is our next part.
The placoderms. Now to fully understand what placoderms are, we need to look at the vertebrate family tree, and in doing so, we'll get an understanding of not only our ancestry, but the ancestry of basically every backbone vertebrate alive today. Now placoderms, like most fish of the Devonian, even today, are jawed fish. Before them, there were simple and primitive jawless fish, who could only open their mouths and hope to catch a meal in them. A revolution occurred when our jawed ancestors evolved from previous forms that could simply open and close their mouths, and were able to do so stronger, tighter, and quicker, with muscles and internal skeletons of derived gill apparatuses. These were the nothostomatas. Placoderms were considered the most basal or primitive members of this group, breaking off from our common ancestor with cartilaginous fishes very early on. Placoderms, bony fish, and cartilaginous fish were believed to have evolved from boneless fish and into their distinct groups separately, with bony fish and cartilaginous fish being more closely related to one another than to placoderms, placoderms evolving entirely separate to them. Placoderms and bony fish evolving bony skulls independently, and sharks, rays, and other cartilaginous fish never evolving them at all. And it sounds nice and jiffy, but it is now wrong. Now here is where I bring up that comment earlier about placoderms, cartilaginous fish, and bony fish being distinct and separate in evolution from each other, evolving from a common ancestor but nonetheless evolving independently. Well, an amazing discovery was made as recently as less than three years ago, which completely changed this entire now likely outdated concept that cartilaginous fish and bony fish and related groups are actually, wait for it, descended from placoderms themselves and thus are technically highly derived placoderms. This discovery was the small Silurian placoderm, Intelognathus, which possessed an entirely different jaw anatomy to most other placoderms. While most placoderms had simple beak-like jaws, Intelognathus had jaws with traits consistent of bony fishes and tetrapods such as the premaxilla, maxilla, and dentary. This is completely the opposite of what was originally hypothesized. Instead of the common ancestor of cartilaginous and bony fishes being boneless, and bony skulls and skeletons evolving in bony fishes after the two split, in reality, cartilaginous and bony fish share a common bony skulled ancestor that was actually very likely a type of placoderm. And sharks, rays, etc. progressively lost this bony content, while bony fish merely retained it and refined it. It is a very, very monumental discovery and means basically we found evidence that we very well might be placoderms ourselves, and that even sharks, bony fish, such as coelacanths to lungfish to dinosaurs, descended from a placoderm common ancestor, the great uncle of something like Intelognathus. So sharks might even be classified as placoderms now too, even though they don't even have bones. New studies have shown the tree might have actually looked like this, instead of this. So believe it or not, this means placoderms never died out, but are actually have become one of the most successful groups in all of Earth's history. Now I know I'm starting to bore you with his ancestry crap about saying how we probably descend from swimming bear traps, so let's stick to what we consider true, now extinct placoderm, which basically includes everything else other than sharks, bony fish, etc. The more traditional placoderms were extremely diversified, from the flat, almost stingray-like, Rhinidea, to the almost shark-like, Brindabella piece. But there was one main group that was the most successful, Arthrodea. Arthrodea will be the focus today, as they are the group that encompasses Dunkleosteus and others. Arthrodea is interesting because unlike bony fishes, which have teeth that evolve from modified scales, yes your teeth are modified scales, look it up, all Arthrodeas, save for Compagopicius, lacked teeth, and used instead the sharpened edges of bony plates, termed tooth plates, as a biting surface. The tooth of such placoderms like Dunkleosteus are growths of solid bone, which were self-sharpening blades, meaning they scraped against each other like knife blades, meaning the Devonian seas would have been filled with horrible scraping noises. This group of placoderms also had a bony ring in their eye sockets, which probably helped to keep the shape of their eyes and protect them from damage, a feature shared by birds and some ichthyosaurs. Arthrodea was the most diverse of the placoderms, occupying roles from giant apex predators to bottom feeders. The largest and probably most terrifying was Dunkleosteus, and this guy is the focus for the rest of this episode. I can hear a thousand voices saying, finally, he's talking about the dunk. Dunkleosteus, meaning Dunkle's bone after David Dunkle, a museum curator, I wish I had a beaked monster fish named after me. 
Discovered in the late 1800s, scientists must have been shocked by such a fearsome face. Several fossil specimens are known, but unfortunately they only preserve the formidable bony head and jaws. So exactly how the rest of the body of this creature looked is unclear. Thankfully, a smaller close relative to Dunkleosteus, Cocosteus, which would greatly resemble a small dunk in life, has better preserved fossils with soft tissue of the rest of its body, and we can estimate and theorize what the Dunkleosteus looked like in life based off of this animal. From what we know of Cocosteus, the large the largest Dunkleosteus was around 20 feet, slightly larger than most great white sharks, and possessed a dorsal fin on the lower section of its body, an almost rat-like fluke, as well as several pectoral fins, as well as shark-like mating claspers on its ventral sides of its body. It would be truly a threatening animal in life, and would probably be the largest predator to exist on Earth up until this time. It is still dwarfed by larger marine predators later on in the future, but nonetheless it was pretty large and pretty scary. Now we should first talk about the jaws of this animal. Dunkleosteus' jaws were unbelievably powerful, but definitely not the most powerful, more on that later. The jaws of Dunkleosteus possessed a four-bar linkage mechanism, from the jaw opening to the connection between the skull, the neck shield, lower jaw, and jaw muscles, which would have been held together by joints that could move, and thus swing the massive lower jaw open and close. This mechanism allowed the opening and closing of the mouth to be exceptionally fast. The speed of the opening would be 20 milliseconds, and the entire process of opening and closing is calculated to be 50 to 60 milliseconds. This high speed would not only create a bite that puts four to 5,000 newtons of force on its teeth and anything caught between them, capable of crushing and smashing some of the most powerful armor, but would open so quickly that it would cause a suction into the animal's mouth, as water pools towards the animal's jaws, pulling fish, arthropods, and cephalopods with it. Like a vacuum, these unlucky prey items would stand no chance once they saw those jaws open. This bite force is of course far from the highest, as great whites produce one at 20,000, and T-Rex is capable of creating over 35,000 newtons, and even these all are put to shame by the mind-boggling piranhas, which is 300,000 newtons. Poor Dunkleosteus is looking wimpy now. Well, no fear, Dunkleosteus has another trick of its sleeve none of these posers had, because on these jaws rest formidable blades. As said before, like all Arthrodea, Dunkleosteus did not have teeth and instead had sharp jaw blades of bone. Swimming with the Dunkleosteus would be accompanied by scraping sounds. These blades would form a beak-like or bear trap-like mouth that broke bone and sliced through the armor of smaller, less lucky placoderms. Now, an interesting theory has come about concerning this beak. Most depictions of Dunkleosteus and other placoderms depict this bony beak bearing without lips or soft tissue coverings, like this, this, or this. New evidence suggests like many modern predatory fish, Dunkleosteus had lips covering its beak and jaws, meaning it probably looked more like this and not like this. Paleontologist and blogger Jamie Hedden points out modern fish with far more powerful bite forces such as piranhas and great whites, when they close their mouths, their teeth and jaws are hidden behind soft tissue lips. Jamie suggests Dunkleosteus and other placoderms were similar, with their fearsome blades concealed behind fleshy maws, like sharks or big lip piranhas of modern day. He said it is unclear how much lip covering would be on these animals' teeth, from an almost complete covering to very thin. But it seems likely that these teeth weren't fully exposed, like past depictions. Who knows, maybe Dunkleosteus was less like a skeletal armored horror with sharp blades sticking out of its naked face, and more like a beluga with lips covering its almost entire armor plating and soft tissue. So, Dunkleosteus might not have looked so fearsome after all, and although had a powerful bite and terrifying beak, could have all been hidden behind some lips. Of course, we don't know if this is for certain, but it is still an interesting speculation with some evidence to support it. Remember, almost all fish with powerful bite forces like sharks and piranhas, whenever they close their mouths, their teeth disappear behind lips. Maybe Dunkleosteus and other placoderms were similar. Interestingly, unlike all tetrapods, us terrestrial fish, Dunkleosteus' jaws grew differently than us. Tetrapods have graceful jaws that start out weak and thin, and as the animal grows, become stronger. Dunkleosteus juveniles are the complete opposite of this. We know from younger individuals, Dunkleosteus were born with already robust, powerful bite sources, proportional to adults, only on a smaller scale. This means they had the ability to crush and smash from birth, and could do so as powerful as adults just on a much smaller scale. And this brings me to another interesting topic about Dunkleosteus and other placoderms. They gave live birth. Yes, such a mammalian trait was actually exhibited in these early jawed fish. We have quite a few direct evidences placoderms gave birth to live young. Fossils of Incisoscetum, a member of Arthrodiria, have been found containing unborn fetuses, indicating that Arthrodias gave birth to live young. Another fossil of a placoderm more distantly related to Dunkleosteus was a female Matapicius, which died in the process of giving birth to live young, and was fossilized with the umbilical cord still attached to its baby. Dunkleosteus, like its relatives, gave birth to live young too. 
Meaning a scene like this would have been common in the Devonian. A mother delivering a child in the open ocean. Again, not the fearsome sea monster we make her out to be. Even Uncle Estes mating seems like it must have been a spectacle. Man, I really need to clear my internet searches. Placoderms were probably the first fish to reproduce through mating and internal fertilization. They had claspers like those of modern sharks and rays, which differed between the genders. Male claspers could insert into female ones and thus copulate. These claspers are much more mobile compared to modern sharks and thus could be rotated even forward. Meaning mating would have looked like this for Dunkleosteus. We don't know for certain, but it's interesting to speculate what mating peculiarities Dunkleosteus might have possessed. Modern great whites and other sharks mate very bizarrely. Most modern male sharks, including whites, literally bite onto the female's neck region to get a grip while mating, leaving scars and bite marks on their skin, made by their fearsome teeth and jaws. Maybe Dunkleosteus might have done something similar. There's absolutely no evidence of this mating, and because placoderm claspers were more maneuverable than that of sharks, it seems unlikely, but nonetheless, something interesting to theorize, or at least ponder how these marine titans reproduced. Let's move on to the other traits about the dunk. Like all placoderms, it had thick armor plating of bone on its head area, meaning it was a slow yet powerful swimmer. The armor probably protected Dunkleosteus from, well, things like other Dunkleosteus and other armored fishes with powerful bites. Just the time period Dunkleosteus was alive in is interesting. It lived during the late Devonian era. 380 to 360 million years ago. During the time Dunkleosteus was alive, so was the transitionary form Tiktaalik, the amphibian Ichthyostega, still many species of giant scorpions and trilobites, and even the massive filter feeding relative to Dunkleosteus, the whale of the Devonian, Titana Ichthys. On a depressing note for the placoderms, that is, this means the race for the land had already been technically won by our lobe-finned fish ancestors, and the placoderms sort of, remember we technically are placoderms, lost. Womp womp. Dunkleosteus actually lasted for a long time. The entire group survived for around 20 million years, living up to basically the end of the Devonian, and it is likely the Devonian Carboniferous mass extinction had a role in that. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, all placoderms, including Dunkleosteus, became extinct by the end of the Devonian. Like a light bulb that glows bright for a short period of time and then dies? That's basically placoderms in a nutshell. And we have no living relatives, meaning these truly bizarre creatures are entirely lacking in our oceans and we don't have anything like them today. They are relics from an older age, an age of the fish, and a battle for the future of our planet between the vertebrates. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this pretty in-depth look at not only Dunkleosteus, but the Devonian and Placoderms as a whole. I certainly learned a lot I didn't know before this video. I find the fact you and I might very well be Placoderms ourselves, and not as unrelated to these armored beasts as once thought, very interesting. Tell me what you think of the Devonian, Dunkleosteus, and Placoderms in the comments section below, and what you think the world would look like if the Devonian was different. Steven Universe video coming up, as well as one on fossil fights. And as always, thanks for watching. See you next time.